Welcome to Co-op Connections, an online workshop sponsored by CDS Consulting Co-op. Thanks for joining us. October is Co-op Month, and in honor of that, we thought we'd kick it off early with our exploration of the sixth Co-op principle, cooperation among cooperatives. We are so honored and grateful to have joining us a most amazing collection of worldwide leaders in the co-op movement. I'd like to thank all of our panelists for joining us today. And as you can see from our list of esteemed colleagues, the depth and breadth of knowledge and expertise gathered here is impressive. And I'm sure you're as anxious as I am to hear what they have to say. So here's how our hour will go. I'll talk for just a few minutes, and then we'll move on to our fantastic panelists. After their presentations, hopefully we've got space for a few questions we'd love for them to answer and discuss before wrapping up our time today. Now here's what we hope to accomplish. Greater understanding of the larger world of co-ops and how our own co-ops fit into that picture. We'll learn more about our own co-op connections, those co-ops and associations that our co-op is a member of or works with heightened enthusiasm about cooperatives. That's always a good thing. We'll celebrate Co-op Month. I think of our hour here as a virtual kickoff party. And getting the word out for the upcoming United Nations International Year of the Cooperative. So we're so glad to have you along today. So without further ado, let's hear what our special guests have to say. First up, I'd like to welcome Paul Hazen, President and CEO of the National Cooperative Business Association. Take it away, Paul. Good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, great to be here, and it's a great time to be a cooperator. We're seeing that people are drawn to cooperatives uh, in the United States and around the world more and more every day. Uh, as people are trying to find solutions to the problems that they're facing in their local communities and around the world. I'm going to talk a little bit today about uh, how cooperatives can work together uh, to improve our local economies, to improve the environment, and to improve the lives of people everywhere. I think it's important to start off to know that uh, there are uh, many cooperatives in our country and, and around the world. Some that you might recognize here, of course, would be uh, Organic Valley, which many of the food co-ops uh, work with. Uh, but there's also other cooperatives like Ace Hardware or Associated Press, uh, Sunkist, or your local food, uh, food co-op that you're a member of, a credit union or a housing cooperative. Uh, next slide, please. No matter, no matter where you are in the United States, there are uh, cooperatives op out there offering services. The organization that I'm privileged to work for, the National Cooperative Business Association, we bring people together from uh, all across different types of cooperatives to work together for common solutions. Uh, we, we provide legislative support, education and training programs, and cooperative development, help giving people in local communities the tools uh, to, uh, to solve the problems that they're facing. Uh, most people from around the world are surprised to learn in the United States the, kind of the citadel of capitalism that we're home to a strong and vibrant vibrant cooperative movement. Uh, in the United States, there are 29,000 cooperatives with over 120 million members. According to the International Cooperative Alliance, the United States accounts for more than 60 of the three largest, 300 largest cooperatives in the world. Uh, in our nation today, we are witnessing another wave of cooperative development in a direct response to the uh, financial collapse and the resulting recession. In response, our citizens are, are doing what they always do in time of crisis. They cooperate. For example, deposits and loans are up at credit unions. Purchasing cooperatives are seeing record sales. And people are forming local alternative energy cooperatives uh, to provide themselves with solar and wind power. Buying groups are, are flourishing. And more and more people are joining worker cooperatives. Once, once more, people are putting their faith in cooperation to bring the United States out of recession. The United States has a strong and enduring sentiment that can help you trust your cooperative. And that's never been more true than now. Uh, next slide, please. Cooperatives are woven into the fabric of our nation. Uh, over 70% of the U.S. adult population are members of cooperatives. Just last year, there was a study released by the University of Wisconsin 
which showed the uh, basic statistics for cooperatives here in the United States. On your screen you can see those, but you have some very impressive numbers. Over two million jobs are created by uh, uh, cooperatives in our country. We have over three trillion dollars in assets and one percent of the uh, GDP. I'm proud to say that our organization, NCBA, was the spearhead to get these uh, cooperative data assembled. It's the first time ever that we've had complete data on all types of cooperatives. I'm going to go a little bit deeper now on the next slide into some more statistics about uh, cooperatives. Commercial sales and marketing cooperatives uh, provide a, a variety of uh, services uh, to uh, people around the country. There are five subsectors here, mainly in the farming and craft and retail sectors. This sector accounts for almost $61 billion in assets and $175 billion in revenue. Uh, next slide. Social service and public service uh, cooperatives are composed of firms that provide a diverse array of health care, housing, transportation, and educational services. Housing co-ops dominate this aggregate sector in terms of the number of entities, but health care dominates in the terms of economic activity. I, be I bet you didn't know that there are over 300 health care cooperative providers in the United States with $1 billion in assets and $3.2 billion in revenue. Next slide, please. Financial services are composed of credit unions, banks, and the farm credit system, and mutual insurance companies. The uh, cooperative financial sector accounts for the largest share of, share of assets, followed by mutual insurance, uh, credit unions, and the farm credit. There are over 8,000 credit unions in the United States with over 90 million members. Uh, they collectively account for about 6% of the assets in, in our total economy, uh, mainly focused on consumer goods and services. Next slide, please. Utility cooperatives provide electric, telephone, and water services. There are over 4,500 of these uh, cooperatives. We were surprised when we started this survey. We thought there were only about 900 uh, electric cooperatives and 600 uh, telephone cooperatives. But we found over 3,000 water cooperatives spread out through this, uh, our entire country. Once again, people providing themselves with goods and services that they couldn't get uh, in the marketplace. So what does this all add up to? Well, we can see on the next slide uh, the map of the United States and where all the different types of cooperatives are located. And uh, we will be using this data to later this year come out with a, uh, a website uh, where you'll be able to search for all the cooperatives in uh, your community and, and across your state and across the entire country. Um, and so this will be an example of the type of thing that we could do on a global basis if we had all the different types uh, of cooperatives in a database to encourage people to find uh, cooperatives. Next slide, please. Cooperatives impact the lives of Americans every minute of every day. Having the data on U.S. cooperatives shows the public and the government that there's a, that this is the case. That only, uh, but it's only part of NCBA work. NCBA's work. We've also taken Gallup polls that reveal that people would rather do business with cooperatives. Surveys have found that only 40 percent of consumers understand the cooperative difference. But when the cooperative model is explained. 66% would rather do business with cooperatives. What we find is that consumers trust cooperatives, and we hope to build upon this trust and prove these numbers with this data and research. Raising the consumer awareness of the cooperatives and linking cooperatives around the world are just two reasons that we have been working through our uh, international organization, the International Cooperative Alliance, uh, to help pass a United Nations resolution. Next slide, please designating 2012 as the International Year of Cooperatives. The United Nations has uh, set up, uh, has asked our government to set up a national committee with all people from the government and stakeholders and UN agencies to coordinate activities here in the United States to promote the International Year of Cooperatives. We're working through our international organization, the ICA, who is leading this campaign to bring the world together into a common strategy for celebrating the International Year. We are forming our own committees here in the United States, and you can go to NCBA's website 
at ncba.coop, uh, next slide please, to find out where we're focusing our attention. We're focusing our effort on uh, first raising our profile of cooperatives before our government and consumers, secondly focusing on social media to reach out to young people, and third on developing the research and the case for cooperatives to demonstrate that cooperatives are the better business model. Early next year, uh, the, United, the uh, uh, United States Senate will be considering a resolution designating 2012 as the International Year of Cooperatives here in the United States and asking Pre President Obama to celebrate this important milestone. And we will look for, uh, forward to your participation in helping us, helping us to convince your senators to, to support that resolution. Last slide, please. Cooperatives have always grown in the time of economic crisis, and so this economic, current economic crisis gives us a unique opportunity to promote cooperatives uh, to people in our uh, communities, to people in our nation, and to people around the world. You can find out more information on the NCBA website, which is the next slide. And let's go to the next slide where you can actually find links for many of the, much of the information that I've provided with you today. So Joel, that's the conclusion of my presentation and I look forward to answering questions uh, later. Now for the next five minutes, we're pleased to have joining us Charles Gould, Director General of the International Cooperative Alliance. Take it away, Chuck. Thank you, Joel. Uh, it's a privilege for me to be part of this, uh, this webinar. I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, let me share what uh, that reinforce what Paul said, and that is that this is a very exciting time for cooperatives. We have a wonderful story to tell, and uh, we need to tell it more frequently, and we, frankly, we need to tell it better. And we have a real opportunity to, uh, to do that, especially with the United Nations year uh, coming up in 2012, which I'm going to talk about in just, uh, in just a bit. Uh, in the next uh, five minutes, what I'd like to be able to do is to uh, give you a, first a sense of the, uh, the incredible network that you are part of as part of the cooperative movement around the world. And I'm going to do that by talking uh, just a, a little bit about the International Cooperative Alliance, who we are, who we represent, how we came about, and then uh, highlight a couple of the key initiatives that we have underway now that uh, I think are of some real relevance for you. So in the, uh, the, the next slide shows you the, uh, the statement about who the International Cooperative Alliance is. And we see ourselves as the global voice for the cooperative movement. Uh, short and, uh, sh short and, uh, and simple. Uh, so we uh, represent cooperatives uh, at global bodies, for example. And if you move on the next slide, you'll, you'll see some of that. Uh, we represent cooperatives at the uh, United Nations with United Nations agencies. Uh, we are headquartered in Geneva, so we're right uh, there with the European uh, Center for the, for the uh, United Nations, with the headquarters for the International Labor Organization, and with other uh, NGOs who work in this, uh, in this space. Uh, ICA came about in 1895 when cooperators from around the world uh, came together in London and decided that they wanted to form a, a, a representative body that would help advance the movement and advance the, the uh, interests of, uh, of cooperatives. Uh, since that time, as you'll see on the, on the screen, we have grown to where we now have members in over 90 countries. And, uh, and we aggressively manage the cooperative image and speak for cooperatives. Uh, some, of those, some of that is on uh, sort of general development issues, on getting out the word about uh, who cooperatives are, what our principles are. We see ourselves as really stewards for the, the values and principles of the cooperative movement. And our members are very active in making certain that those uh, uh, stay alive and are refreshed and relevant, and yet that they also stay true to the, to the roots of the, uh, the cooperative movement. And we also uh, provide that representation in technical ways, for example, by working with the International Accounting Standards Board to make certain that the accounting standards that are adopted and that influence accounting practices around the world recognize the unique uh, needs of cooperative enterprises. So we do this uh, with the uh, a board that's elected uh, by the members. You'll see that on the slide. Uh, we are very representative. Uh, we don't sit in Geneva and, and just uh, try and dream up new initiatives. We're very driven by the, the members we have. And we have four regions uh, who elect uh, uh, board members. 
and the vice presidents, for example, come one from each of the regions. On the next slide, you'll see the other uh, members of our of our international board, uh, including Paul Hazen from the United States, who you just heard speak. So uh, the U.S. cooperatives are very well uh, represented uh, as well. We have, in addition to the regions, we have specific uh, sectoral organizations in key uh, cooperative areas, and you'll see them listed on the next slide, so that we have the facility to take positions that are business related in these various sectors. So it's a, it's a complex organization, it's one that's developed over the years, and we have both regional and sectoral um, facilities. The, the, the key initiatives that we have uh, right now, I'm going to talk about just briefly. And on the next slide, you'll see the one that Paul uh, alluded to, the United Nations International Year of Cooperatives. This is our key priority for the next two years. Uh, it is an opportunity to uh, tell our story. It's an opportunity to make certain that uh, the public is aware that cooperatives are successful business enterprises, that they are values-based, and that they have the scale and impact to really make a difference uh, in the world and to solve many of the problems that people around the world are experiencing today. So our board has um, uh, determined that the key priority that we should take on on the global level is raising public awareness of cooperatives as a successful values-based enterprise. Uh, we will be uh, launching a public relations campaign to do this. We'll launch this at our General Assembly in Mexico in November of 2011, and it will run throughout the, uh, the following year, through 2012. And our hope is that we will be able to uh, persuade our members around the world to adopt the same slogan and image of cooperatives as part of their, their marketing materials, as part of the packaging of their products, as part of posters, brochures, and other means that they already have of communicating to the public so that we can integrate a consistent message around the world and drum it home time and again so people see the same image. And so we can, get, we can catch their attention uh, and make them curious to know more about cooperatives. Another way that we're doing that on the next screen is our Global 300 report. Uh, this is a report that uh, we'll be producing again at the end of December, and it lists the largest cooperatives around the world. And what we want to do with this is to make sure that the business press and the media and the public are aware that there are large cooperatives as well as small local community cooperatives that this is a, a values-based model that can rise to size and scale to really solve problems beyond single communities, and that it is a, a serious uh, business model that needs to be playing a larger role in economies around the world. And we want them to understand that, in fact, that is happening now. The largest 300 uh, cooperatives around the world have a collective uh, annual revenue in excess of $1 trillion uh, US dollars. So they're already 10% of the global economy, and that's just the 300 largest. So we want to make certain that that message is part of the public awareness of cooperatives. Uh, finally, on the next screen, you'll see a reference to uh, the International Cooperative Alliance's Expo 2010. Uh, every two years, we have a trade fair. Uh, this year, it will be coming up in December, and the dates are there, in uh, Bangalore, uh, India. And it's an opportunity for buyers to come together with Cooperators, cooperators who are displaying their, their products and uh, create new markets for them. So on the, on the last slide, uh, I just want to, uh, in summary, uh, reiterate that uh, this, this is the kind of time that's very exciting for cooperatives. It's a time in which cooperate, cooperatives thrive. Uh, we have a message to tell that the current uh, dominant economic system has weaknesses in it. People know that. They're receptive to a new model. They're thirsty for a model that has human scale. And we believe that the International Year is a wonderful opportunity for us to, to respond to that, uh, that interest that the public has to, to discover new ways of, of doing business and meeting their needs. Uh, we believe at ICA that by the end of this decade, uh, cooperatives could be the fastest growing enterprise model uh, in the world. And uh, we uh, look forward to providing some leadership to make that happen. 
So thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Chuck. Let's please welcome Robin Schrader, President of the National Cooperative Grocers Association. Okay. Thanks very much. Um, uh, to the next slide, please. Uh, my organization go from Chuck talking about things from a global perspective um, down to a very sector-specific uh, um, association here in the United States. Next slide, please. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background, uh, the National Cooperative Grocers Association was formed out of several regional associations that had grown up over a period of time. The first was in 1992 in the Midwest. And then by 1996, we had six different regional cooperative associations across the country. These were groups of, of co-ops within you know, multi-states, uh, two to three, sometimes you know, more than that, that were working together trying to find commonalities of, of how they could leverage themselves against competition. Next slide, please. NCGA was officially formed in 1999, and then we incorporated in 2000. At that time, we had just a little bit over half the number of stores that we have currently today, about 270 million in total sales. And we, had a, we operated in a federated system, which meant that the regional associations were the actual members of NCGA. In 2004, we reor reorganized that structure so now that every single individual co-op that's a member of NCGA is a direct member, no longer through a regional association. Next slide. So today, NCGA is a business services purchasing cooperative for 114 consumer-owned food co-ops. We operate over 140 locations uh, in 32 states. Our aggregate sales are now just over $1.3 billion. And we are the second largest segment next to Whole Foods in the natural foods industry in the United States. Next slide. So one of the reasons we're extremely uh, happy and thrilled that we made the move that we did in 2004 to then have a national purchasing agreement in 2006 with our main supplier is that none of us saw the recession coming. So this chart will show you what kind of happened to not only the big guys, but happened to us. Um, just to give perspective here, the blue bars are inflation. The dark blue bar at the top showing the same sort of curve as the, as the red line on the bottom. The dark blue line is us. That's, that's food co-ops. And the red line is Whole Foods Market. So you can see that the recession kind of hit the industry very similar to all of us. However, we took much less of a hit than our, than our largest competitor, our conventional competitor, and um, we attribute that to a lot of things, but most notably to the fact that we were organized together so that every cooperative in our system had access to much better pricing than they would have had going into that recession on their own. Next slide. So we operate in a, in a few different program areas. Um, first and foremost, we operate in our development side, which is all of our general managers and staff below them at the department level working together to um, peer support, to share best practices, to develop their skills, and really raise the bar of operational excellence within their cooperatives. At the national level, we do a great deal of advocacy and outreach. We are a proud founding member of the National Organic Coalition, which is becoming an increasingly strong voice in, in Washington for issues on organic standards, um, small farmer and local food systems. And then our purchasing and marketing departments are our two largest departments within NCGA, and they work closely together on a number of, of key programs for our members. Next slide. Our purchasing department uh, recently renewed our primary supply agreement with our, with our main supplier, United Natural Foods Incorporated, and that was really a timely event because so many things changed um, just after renewing that agreement with UNFI, including leadership changes, their segue into the Canadian market. So we are very happy to be, to be safe within our, our preferred pricing for all of our cooperatives for another five years. We're transitioning from a monthly to bi-weekly promotions program. And any of you that shop in a grocery store know that promotions can, can very much drive what happens you know, month to month, week to week in those stores. So um, we see this as a, as a big benefit coming up to really increase our marketability against other competitors that are doing more frequent promotions. We also have a non-cost of goods program with everything from deli containers, shopping bags, credit card processing, everything from you know, linens to, to inventory services to janitorial services. There's a wider range of, of non-core services that we buy as a group. 
Next slide, please. And you can see that you know our purchases are really increasing on the non-cost of goods side. And this is one you know point I want to make with with cooperatives organized like ourselves. There's certain things that every grocery store has to do, whether you're a cooperative or not. And it really doesn't mean anything to the consumer because everyone has to mop their floors and everyone has to have their linens cleaned and everyone has to uh, do certain things that don't make a meaningful impact. So we want to take away the burden of some of those issues for our stores so that they can focus on the things that really do make a difference in the consumer's mind of being a cooperative. Next slide, please. And so one of the main things that our marketing department has done over the last several years is to develop, in conjunction with our members, a, a brand new consumer brand that we've launched in 2010. It's called Co-op Stronger Together. And we also have a new consumer-focused website, which is strongertogether.coop, designed to really speak to consumers about the values and qualities of food cooperatives, what makes us different, give them a chance to share their experiences, talk about why they enjoy the cooperative experience more than they, than they do other retailers, We've redesigned all of our packaging and marketing materials with this new brand, um, working closely, of course, with purchasing because everything from our flyers and all of the things that those two business groups do together with an NCGA uh, uh, will have this new brand. Next slide. Is that the chime that I just heard, Joel? Yes, it was. Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to finish quickly and ask you probably not to go through the, the picture slides that I had at the end, but. Um, in the last year, NC, or in, I'm sorry, in the last two and a half years, NCGA has formed a fully owned subsidiary uh, called our Development Cooperative. We work with our member stores in a lot of different areas to, to share best practices, to really increase the learning curve of projects. We're working on 12 new store projects. We'll be involved in seven new stores opening by the middle of 2011. We've successfully opened three in the past year. I don't have time to show you the pictures of those, but um, I appreciate the opportunity to tell you this bit of our story. Thank you. Well, great. Thank you so much, Robin. We can take a quick look at the at the stores here as we scroll through. Again, that was Robin Schrader from the National Cooperative Grocers Association. Great. And now joining us, we have Marilyn Scholl, Manager of CDS Consulting Cooperative. Thank you, Joel. It's really an honor to be a part of this panel today. I really appreciate all the panelists being here and all the participants being here, too. Uh, it's my pleasure today to tell you a little bit about our cooperative, CDS Consulting Co-op. Here on the next slide is a picture of some of our friendly and approachable consultants that were taken at our last retreat held in Bloomington, Indiana. Uh, next time we have a picture taken, we're going to work on demonstrating our professionalism and experience, but this was to show our friendly and approachable nature. Um, we have together over 200 years of experience providing consulting for food co-ops and an average of 22 years of working in the industry amongst our various consultants. Our co-op is a shared services co-op. It's owned by our member consultants. We provide administration, promotion, and other support to our 22 uh, consultant members, each of whom are self-employed independent professionals. We've been working together since 1992. Originally, we worked under the umbrella of Cooperative Development Services. And then in 2008, we reorganized as a cooperative. And we're very grateful to CDS and Kevin Edberg for allowing us to retain the initials of CDS, since that's how we had been known in the industry for so many years. So now we're just CDS Consulting Co-op. We're dedicated to building and strengthening cooperative businesses. Our clients are mostly food co-ops. And over the years, we've worked with about 300 different co-ops. We expect that at some point, in the future, at some point in the future, we expect to be able to expand to work with other types of co-ops. Now here are some of our areas of expertise. Uh, th that we specialize in, expansion and growth, improving performance, leadership development, and membership development, and member capitalization. On the next slide, you'll see a little bit more about some of the ways that we help co-ops achieve their goals to be stronger and to better serve their members. We have a lot of tools in our toolbox. And today, I just wanted to emphasize one of our tools, and that's the use of data. Our consultants collect and manage several types of data 
to allow uh, our clients to make sound analysis and good decisions. Our data also helps set benchmarks and measure performance. One of our databases uh, run by our consultants, Kate Sumberg and Walden Swanson, is COCOFIS, Common Cooperative Financial Statements. And that database collects financial and operational data that our food co-op clients can use to identify trends, set benchmark, uh, project future performance for their budgeting. Our market analyst, Debbie Swasuna, uses trade area and sales data, along with demographic and census data, to be able to use an analog approach for sales forecasts. And Carolee Coulter and Mary Corteau use staff surveys, and, and they use their data from those to help co-ops achieve great workplaces for their employees. So our use of data is just one example of how we bring value to food co-ops. Uh, we are very pleased and gratified with the results of our client survey that we conducted last April. Our clients overwhelmingly agree that our support and resources are useful, that our work meets their expectations, and our services are worth the cost. One of our major programs is the Cooperative Board Leadership Development, or CBUILD, program. Currently, we have 74 co-ops enrolled in CBUILD. Since 2005, we've provided ongoing focused support to boards of directors of food co-ops. CBUILD provides each co-op with a set of services tailored to meet their individual needs, as well as some programs for the 74, the combined group of co-ops participating. One of those is a regional foundations class for new directors. We offer that nine times a year around the country. Uh, I think we've had over 1,000 people now who have participated uh, in that program. Um, we also have a library, a growing library of useful and timely resources. Today's seminar is part of the CBUILD program, and a recording of this and these slides will be available in the CBUILD in library soon after the session ends. We're also uh, very involved in the growing wave of groups wanting to start a new food co-op that uh, Stuart Reed will be talking about in a minute. Uh, with Cooperative Development Services, we created the Food Co-op Development Model, four cornerstones in three stages. CDS Consulting Co-op provides services in all three stages, but we really specialize in that middle stage of feasibility and planning. There's a, a huge wave of new food co-ops uh, groups getting started that Stuart will tell you more about, but in the last three years alone, we've provided service to 45 of those new co-op groups. The uh, CDS Consulting Co-op has a board of directors that uses policy governance. Our ENDS policies are shown here. Our board includes five consultants elected from our membership and one appointed director. That's Kevin Edberg. As you can see here from our ENDS, we exist to support a growing and diverse network of cooperative businesses. We anticipate expanding our client base to include other types of cooperatives sometime in the future. There are really two major prongs here on our ENDS policies that we focus on. Uh, one is providing a right livelihood to our consultants. And that allows, uh, and secondly, to help co-ops get stronger. So that means that we support our members and our consultants so that they can focus their efforts on helping, the, their, helping our co-ops achieve their goals. We hold ourselves accountable for accomplishing both of these outcomes. We also publish a bi-monthly newsletter. Solutions is now in its 10th year. Uh, you can register uh, for a free subscription if you aren't already at our website, which is cdsconsulting.coop. Just click the uh, solution sign, sign up button on the left side. Uh, in addition, I'd welcome any contact from anyone who's participating with questions or comments about our co-op or about this presentation. So thank you very much. I appreciated a chance to tell you more about CDS Consulting Co-op. Thanks, Marilyn. Stuart Reed, Executive Director, Food Co-op Initiative. All right, thank you. Uh, OK, can go ahead to the next slide. Food Co-op Initiative is an organization that was created by many of the other people in this conversation today. Uh, when we realized that there were a lot of new co-ops suddenly forming after a time when there hadn't been too many. 
And uh, these are my butterflies that are flittering around out there looking for help and assistance and nourishment. And we're trying to provide them with a place where they can find a, a home and the help they need. Uh, for that purpose, we, we act as a reference library and a sort of a networking hub for groups that need to get that support to work from a grassroots level. OK, next. To do that, we offer advice uh, on the phone and by internet for the most part. We offer referrals to professional organizations and consultants that can provide deeper levels of support than we can in, in technical areas. We offer training resources in the form of documents and links and uh, directories on our website. We do some live training on a limited basis when we, when we are participating in workshops and conferences. And when financing permits, we also have some small seed grants to begin the development process in co-ops to help them get off the ground. And we work with NCB, the National Co-op Bank, to provide sprout loans to co-ops that are nearing implementation and opening so that they can bridge the gap between raising funds and getting their final loans from their bank or members, as the case may be. Right now, there's contacts that we have with over 380 individuals or organizations that are working to support co-ops. That represents something just shy of probably 300 organizations. And, and of those, I expect half to two-thirds will probably be successful in opening a co-op someday. Uh, we also supply some help to other co-op development organizations when they need assistance or advice on how best to support the co-ops that contact them. And increasingly, we're being uh, used as a resource for the press to get information about what's going on in this world of co-op development. Why are there so many new co-ops? And what are they bringing to the, their communities? That's a, that's a wonderful thing that we can do. OK? You can advance me. There is a map that uh, we put together fairly recently. It's already out of date, though showing the locations of some of the groups that are trying to organize co-ops right now. And as you may be able to tell, it's almost everywhere in the United States. Uh, 46 out of 50 states at my last count had uh, at least one organizing group, and it may now be more than that. OK. We do offer referrals primarily to consulting organizations like Maryland's CDS Consulting Co-op and other consultants out there. We will suggest legal advice, sources of legal advice. There's a limited number of lawyers who truly understand uh, consumer co-op law. We, we tell people about the grant programs that we're aware of, including our own. And we'll send people off to other co-op organizations and other resource databases as, a, as is appropriate. OK. The resources that we offer are primarily on our website so that they can be accessed as needed and at no cost whenever a, an organization needs them. And we can send people there without having a lot of infrastructure in our own organization to support that, the, what we offer to them. Here's a quick uh, screenshot of our home page. Uh, we have it organized so that they can find resources easily, and uh, we can update it quickly. Next slide. Among the resources on our site are these. I'm not going to go through them all, but you can see that we have quite a lot of different opportunities for finding information and uh, delving deeper when that's needed. Next. The training we offer has been uh, extensively through webinar presentations, much like this one, mostly co-sponsored with the CDS Consulting Co-op and using their consultants to help provide top line training you know, 90 minute or less format on the web. And we've been able to record those and offer them as recordings on the website through CDS CC. And uh, that's been just wonderful. We also do live trainings at the Consumer Cooperative Management Association and are planning a series of regional workshops this coming year. Co-ops that we work very closely with, generally those that have gotten funding from our organization, we make sure we do at least one site visit, meet with their boards and their organizers, and provide some uh, face time with them to have really get to know them better, understand their needs, and serve them any way we can. Next. 
Our seed grants are early development support up to $10,000. They're small, but they're coming at a critical time when, when these new founding co-ops probably don't have much resource of any other kind. They often have not started a membership campaign even or have only just begun it. So this helps them to get off the ground. They match that funding with money that they raise locally to encourage them to be involved. And uh, we get that through sponsorships from other organizations, from grants made to us. Next. The Sprout Loan Program is a fund that was created by NCB. We make recommendations for loans from that fund of up to $25,000, again, matched by the co-op and used to help bridge the gap at the end of their organizing process. Next, please. Finally, I think what we offer that is particularly important to a lot of groups is just a sympathetic ear. We're there to listen. We're there for questions that come from left field as well as right. And we do our best to at least provide some encouragement whenever that's reasonably possible, but also to be realistic about what the opportunities and, and barriers are for an individual group that they need to deal with. Next, please. We are a nonprofit organization, and although we were supported by a, a number of professional organizations in the past, including the uh, National Co-op Grocers Association and CDS and, and uh, the National Co-op Bank, Right now, our primary funding is from the Blooming Prairie Foundation, and uh, they make our work possible. So we want to thank them. Next. And uh, well, there I go, scooting by. Uh, there's their contact information. Uh, right now, this is a one-person organization, and uh, if you do contact us, you'll get to talk to me. Otherwise, uh, in the near future, we do hope to be expanding with at least one more person to provide support to all of these organizations out there. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks so much. That was uh, Stuart Reed, Executive Director of the Food Co-op Initiative. And now we've got Kevin Edberg, Executive Director of Cooperative Development Services. Thank you very much, Joel. As with the other members, it's a real privilege for me to be able to participate and uh, uh, in this session and to see the number of ways that our organizations that are presenting here have all cooperated in the past and are telling a common story about uh, cooperatives and the opportunities that are created both through existing ones as well as uh, ones that we hope to uh, yet uh, uh, create. Next slide please, Joel. So I'm privileged to work with a nonprofit organization. Um, uh, sharing here our vision and mission, and I particularly get jazzed about the uh, uh, the vision for the work that we get to do in helping people create new cooperatives or uh, to expand existing ones. That vision that I think is particularly ripe and necessary uh, in this economic time, not just in our country but around the world, that uh, people working cooperatively and responsibly can take ownership of their well-being um, and secure that well-being through organizations that they own and control. And I think that's a, a particularly uh, powerful vision for uh, certainly the folks that I work with, um, people in this country, and I believe around the world. We work with a, a number of uh, organizations, not just cooperatives, but uh, pretty much any kind of organization that um, uh, builds or contributes to uh, cooperative and sustainable development. But the vast majority of our, of our clients are indeed cooperatives. Next slide, please. We're a 25-year-old uh, nonprofit. We were originally created by uh, the Wisconsin Federation of Cooperatives, which is a trade association of co-ops. Um, and the experience that they were having at that time was that this trade association that does uh, uh, lobbying and member education we're getting these requests from people who wanted to start co-ops, and they pretty quickly realized that the skill sets that you have on staff when you want to do that kind of work are not the same skill sets that you have on staff when you're going to do uh, lobbying and education. So they took the tin cup around the co-op community, uh, both in and outside of Wisconsin, and formed an organization. Um, in, in essence, the co-op community birthing uh, a new organization that would focus on this mission of starting new cooperatives. Uh, we worked originally in uh, uh, Justin, Wisconsin, then started working in uh, uh, 
uh, Minnesota and Iowa, and that is where the um, bulk of our work continues to be done today, though we do work uh, uh, with clients all over the country. The majority of them are here in the upper Midwest. And we work in areas of agriculture, environmental stewardship, and community development. It's in the area of community development that our history of food co-ops has been. Um, can back up, please. Um, in the area of uh, community development that our work with food co-ops has been done. Uh, we spent, uh, in a, for about 17 years, partnering with the independent consultants that today make up CDS Consulting Co-op, uh, providing an administrative structure inside of which they could grow their, uh, uh, grow their team from one person in 1991 to uh, about 15 of them when uh, they formed, we helped them form the, uh, their cooperative a couple of years ago. Uh, both the Seabuild uh, programs and Cocoa Fist were uh, originally created by our partnership, and uh, I'm really proud of that. The, um, later on, uh, my organization was one of those folks that helped create what was known then as Food Co-op 500. Today is Stewart's organization, Food Co-op Initiative. And uh, so we've been very active in helping think through what are the metrics and the requirements for helping an individual community start their own cooperative. And uh, we've been pleased to be a, a part of that, uh, uh, that whole process. Uh, today our work uh, is focusing mostly on communities in our region that are wanting to start new cooperatives. Um, and uh, so I partner with uh, Stuart in that, uh, in that initiative. And on occasion, we get requests from existing cooperatives that uh, need some help with grant writing or finding other resources for their expansion projects or other issues that they're dealing with. And we are very pleased to be able to uh, maintain those relationships and partnerships with the uh, food co-op community. One last thing that I'll mention here, uh, inside of our environmental stewardship area is our work with in sustainable agriculture. And so we do an extensive amount of work with farmer-owned businesses and cooperatives that are providing natural, organic, and sustainable foods, basically forming the, uh, the, the, the supply chain for natural food cooperatives. So while we're working in those settings with farmers, uh, in many cases, we are developing the supply chain that becomes products available in natural food cooperatives. Next slide, please. I mentioned that we are a cooperative development center. Um, there are about 20 organizations around the country uh, that have been uh, 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 created in the last 25 years to do this work. Um, those 20 organizations affiliate inside of another organization called Cooperation Works. And that's uh, basically the national network of co-op development centers. Um, the website is there, and I'm going to show a map in just a moment. Why don't you go ahead. Uh, next slide. So that um, the, you can access information, regardless of what part of the country you're in, um, you can go to the Cooperation Works website and learn about a center that is near you. Um, many of them uh, will work with um, uh, consumer-owned cooperatives. Um, several are, work, are very intentional partners with Food Co-op Initiative and with CDSCC. And um, uh, many are also members of NCBA. So there's uh, a strong synergy there. And I guess my plug would be, while CDS, Cooperative Development Services, works primarily in the upper Midwest, uh, we have this whole network of other uh, nonprofit organizations that work in cooperative development and whose work is available to the people who are on this call uh, as uh, uh, potential sources of information, referral, um, information about grant programs, etc. cetera. Uh, next slide, please. And that concludes my little snippet about the, the development part of, uh, of uh, uh, co-ops in uh, through uh, Cooperative Development Centers. Thank you so much, Kevin. And now, now if you'll bear with us, I think we're going to run over maybe about five minutes. Indulge us here. So that leaves us about 10 minutes left for discussion with our panelists. Let's start with our first question. Why is it important that co-op leaders know how they are connected to other co-ops? Anyone can jump in here. Well, I'll start with that, Joel. I was just reading a newsletter from one of our food co-ops this morning, and, and a director was talking about 
um, having attended the recent CCMA conference. And she was uh, sharing in her story to her members how exciting it was for her to realize that her co-op was connected to a worldwide movement of co-ops. She hadn't really recognized that before. And I think, as Paul said earlier, co-ops really are a better way of doing business. But one of the ways that, that many of us who are working in our local co-ops um, on our local issues, are, are, it's really important for us to see that we're not alone in that work. It is important for us to, to work locally, but it's also really helpful, inspiring, um, and gives us hope when we realize that, that we're not alone, that there are other kinds of co-ops out there. Have, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Kevin. I was going to add that it seems to me that the, 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 the language around cooperative economy is a growing theme that is very exciting to many of us. Um, this idea that cooperatives doing business with other cooperatives, not just because they're the only game in town, but because we prefer to do that, and that in our by using our business transactions, we strengthen um, uh, our counterparts who are also using the cooperative model. And that leverages the economic impact that we can have and strengthens the whole uh, the resiliency of the whole cooperative network. And uh, it seems to me that if we're going to have cooperative economy, uh, we have to know who our potential partners are and how we can leverage that. Paul, that might even throw, uh, create an opportunity for some of the linking work that NCBA is doing. Right. Uh, well, you actually made the point I was making, but um, uh, we have a number of different opportunities for cooperatives to come together uh, for their mutual benefit. Uh, one is we have a uh, marketing committee that brings different types of cooperatives together to share best practices and marketing. How do you take advantage of your cooperative difference and and reach out to people who share s similar values? So that's a that's a great opportunity for cooperatives to to work together. Um, you know, we obviously do that in the legislative area where we're all stronger if we all work together. So if there's a cooperative uh, threat out there uh, in the public policy arena by by rallying together we can we can all benefit from that uh, and then just around the cooperative development as Kevin mentioned you know there's there's I often say that cooperatives don't spring up out of the ground organically and we saw many of examples about that today that people go out and organize them so to take a look with the other cooperatives in your community and see where are the needs and then bringing a cooperative solution uh, to those needs, um, you know, is what we're all about as a cooperative movement. This is Chuck Gould. I was just at the global perspective that the same reasons that cooperatives came together in 1895 to form the International Cooperative Alliance, uh, those same reasons are relevant today. And part of that is the the uh, recognition that the stronger the movement is overall, the stronger the connections between cooperatives the more the public sees that this is a way of doing business and not just an isolated uh, transactional approach in a, in a given situation, but that it really is a different way of doing business. That strengthens individual cooperatives as well by strengthening the, the understanding of the cooperative movement. It also strengthens the partnership between sectors that is so important, especially in, in the consumer sector where equity is particularly hard to come by because in some communities there just isn't a lot of assets to be invested. When we can partner with other cooperative organizations to, to get to uh, support these startup efforts, it makes so much difference. I don't really have a whole lot to add that hasn't been well, said, well stated already um, by my colleagues. I guess I just want to thank Paul for the plug for our, our new uh, brand, Stronger Together. But um, I will say that, that some of the most innovative solutions that we've found in our work to serve our member co-ops at NCGA have come from other cooperatives. Um, I could name co-op metrics. I could name LBMX. I mean, and it's been those, and that's just a couple out of a whole array. And so, um, you know, knowing, knowing how to make your business better, sometimes the most creative ideas come from cooperatives. Well, great. Thank you all for your insights. Now I'd love to hear your thoughts on our next question. Now, you all spoke to what you're doing now, but what in the next five to ten years, what do you think will be the most important role 
that co-ops will play and your organization specifically will play in supporting other co-ops. Let me start with oh, that if I oh, can. Oh, this, oh, is oh, a, this is a Chuck Chuck Gould, because I, I think it plays right into the question of the International Year of Cooperatives, which if it is simply a year, and on December 31st of 2012 it ends and we say it was an event and a party and we can uh, feel good about the conversation we had, but if it ends there, then we will have wasted the year. And my hope is that uh, 2012 is really the launch for a repositioning, if you will, of, of the public awareness of, of cooperatives, the importance of cooperatives, the size and scale of cooperatives, the diversity, and how cooperatives are solutions to many of the problems that people are facing in the, in the world. It's, that requires that we use 2012 as the launch of public awareness and not at the, as the end of that. And our hope is that we can begin to introduce an image, if you will, of cooperatives in 2012 that we can then build on in subsequent years and just build consistently over time. And if I could please follow that with just a, a very domestic U.S. view is, is access to capital. And I know absolutely that, that all of the other folks on this panel would agree with me that we could do so much more so much faster if we had better access to capital. So, you know, that is certainly in my in my ten range view of of what we have to accomplish in working together as cooperative organizations and sectors. This this is Paul Hayes, and I'll just build on that. And and not, as uh, uh, Robin knows, we've all been working on that issue of of access to capital, and uh, we have a specific initiative. Um, that we're working on at NCBA is to create an equity fund for uh, for cooperatives to provide a new source of equity. And you know, my vision is that in you know five years, you know that fund has a you know a hundred or two hundred million dollars in it that's available, you know, to help uh, new co-ops get started and help existing co-ops uh, grow. And the other thing that we're going to be doing, and, and um, Chuck laid this out from the ICA, is is really ensuring that the U.S. cooperative movement is you know. Uh, very integrated into the global strategy of, of raising the awareness. I think we'll all benefit by working uh, not only among ourselves here in the U.S., but across borders and with cooperatives around the world. I'd like to jump in and, and share my thoughts on that. I think that we're, our, the current moment is uh, just so unprecedented in the amount of interest there is in, in cooperatives and food co-ops in particular. Uh, we haven't seen this kind of interest in food co-ops for 35 years, not, till, not since the 1970s. And it's, who knows how long it will be before this wave comes around again. And I think we're at a moment in time where it's, it, it, it's, we've, we really have to figure out how to take advantage of this opportunity, how to support people who are trying to do the work in their local communities to get a co-op started. A capital is certainly an important part of that. Accessing a talent is another part of that. Um, helping them shape their vision by sharing what we've been able to accomplish so far. Uh, there's just a, there's just such a need here. Uh, but I think in, in terms of capital formation, the more we are able to leverage our members' money, uh, the more we can provide capital for our co-ops. I think our members are looking for ways to, to put their money in to work for what they believe in and their values and cooperatives certainly are a way to help them do that. I think I see uh, our role at CDS as being um, uh, innovating with the with the startup model and bringing it to some new kinds of communities. Um, I, uh, I want us to continue working with natural food communities and com uh, excuse me natural food cooperatives in communities of all kinds. Um, but I also see an opportunity to bring this model to um, rural communities that are losing grocery stores and people driving 40 miles just to find basic food. Um, and I see my organization working with folks like Stuart to uh, uh, try and uh, innovate with uh, our startup efforts. And I also see an opportunity to grow the base of support for Stuart's work um, in, uh, in and among the, uh, the other cooperative development centers. We've got five or six that are on board with us in a pretty regular way right now. Uh, I'd like to see that number 15 to 20. And um, so that's where my efforts are, are, uh, are being aimed. Speaking directly for our work at 
food co-op initiative, I think one of the contributions we can make going forward is to learn from what we're doing and to provide better approaches for new co-ops to organize effectively and efficiently and, and uh, be able to get more of these stores up to a good start and uh, share those tools with other people so that it can be done across the country. And that, that's my goal. Did we hear from everyone? Excellent. Well, it's obvious there's a lot more discussion we could have on the topic of co-op connections, um, but our time for today is up. Once again, I'd like to extend a special thank you to all of our panelists. We were so excited and honored you could join us. Paul Hazen, NCBA, Charles Gould, ICA, Robin Schrader, NCGA, Stuart Reed, Food Co-op Initiative, Marilyn Scholl, CDS Consulting Co-op, and Kevin Edberg, Cooperative Development Services. On behalf of CDS Consulting Co-op, I'd like to extend my thanks to everyone for being with us today, and we always welcome your feedback. This recording and our entire library of resources will be available online as part of our CBuild library at cdsconsulting.coop, or just search online for CBuild Library. Thanks again for taking part in Co-op Connections, and have a great Co-op Month.